Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out that 14-speed Kindernay rear hub. That's pretty special. We also check out a couple of cool hardtails, one of them from UK brand Kotick and the other one from Kona. In fact, I'd go as far as saying it's the coolest Kona hardtail I've ever seen. Uh, we've also got some wicked homemade tool hacks and some top mods for a new lovely look. enjoyed the start to last week's show having a little bit of a theme to it so I thought I'd carry on on that vein. Now I went out for a ride at the weekend I'm sure a lot of you did as well in fact I'd like to know where you rode let us know in those comments and um, I took that new Mega out for a ride so I've borrowed one in the meantime while I'm waiting for another bike and had a really good time. Um, I spent the first hour or so setting up the brace getting the handlebars in the right position because actually the head tube is about 20 mil longer than it is on my reactor so although the geometry is kind of similar and the layout's all right um, I ended up you know changing things around quite a lot. Now I went to the Forest of Dean and it was a wicked days out riding. Now something I really noticed there was the sheer volume of people. Now there are a lot of people on e-bikes, there are a lot of people on cross-country bikes, loads of people on trail bikes and not many people on downhill bikes. And I did see a few people on downhill bikes and they tended to be a little bit older, so perhaps they were just getting them out for a laugh. But either way, what I did notice was how much they were struggling and how slow they were going. Now, this was nothing to do with their ability. Now, um, you know, I would never say something about someone's ability. This is more just observing the, the bikes in the terrain and looking at how good modern day trail bikes and enduro bikes are. And it really made me wonder, like, are downhill bikes pointless? Because the modern day trail bike or enduro bike is more capable than many downhill bikes on more terrain. You can ride them everywhere. Why, why on earth would anyone want a downhill bike? Not including those that are lucky enough to live near a gravity assisted bike park or some real mountains, of course. You know, that's not everyone. It's not reality for a lot of the world. And yeah, all right, so you live somewhere like that and downhill bike is great. Now I could be, I think downhill bikes, I think they're probably the coolest bikes out there but um, they're just not realistic for a lot of riders, uh, myself included. You think like, if you compare them to horses, you know, you only need a pony to go trekking on green lanes. No point taking a racehorse down there, is there? You know, racehorse needs some proper space to, uh, to get galloping, you know, and it's the same with a downhill bike. If you're taking it to the local woods for a ride, it's kind of constricted. You need some proper terrain to really open up the taps on those things. So uh, here's a few shots anyway, just from my weekend and a bit of footage from the Forest of Dean. But what I want to know, a couple of things. Firstly, do you think enduro bikes are better or downhill bikes are better? Just for argument's sake, let's, let's find out. And also, what's cooler? Is a downhill bike cooler because it's really cool in its pedigree for what it's supposed to do? Or is the enduro bike cooler because you can do more on it? Um, I'd love to know what you think in the comments. I really enjoyed reading the comments from last week's show. Uh, we're going to pick those up shortly. I'm just going to leave you with a little, little bit of thought, actually, that someone planted in my head over the weekend. And that was, all right, so downhill, arguably, some people say it's like the Formula One or the showcase for mountain biking. I kind of agree to that. It's almost like the exhibition form of cycling. But um, the bikes are quite unrealistic now. Like a few years back, a lot of people used to ride downhill bikes just in the woods for fun. You know, think about it, pushing up the hill, you know, get on a bike session back down. But these days, they're quite outreaching there. You can't really imagine what someone could do on them. Now, I wondered what would happen if there was a class of downhill racing or all downhill racing had to be done on regular bikes, on an enduro bike. Sure, they could put a twin crown fork on it, maybe a coil shark, and they could modify some stuff. But I like the idea of it being like a stock class. Like the frame is something that you can buy in the shops that you or I could go pedaling up a hill at the Forest of Dean or South Wales or Moab or wherever you are at the weekend and you're watching the top like the best races the best men and women on the face of the planet competing in the hardest discipline on the same bike I think that'd be sick but um, let us know what you think in those comments okay so straight into news now then and uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the latest version of the E13 cassette uh, this is the helix this is it on the screen now this thing is pretty special now in the past we have looked at them before and it's a bit of a different design to the regular cassettes you see out there by typical brands like SRAM or Shimano now it is compatible with SRAM and Shimano so you can use it on either so this is why I'm telling you about it now the cool thing about it is it has a tiny 9-2 sprocket on the bottom side, which means you can open to a huge range of gears and you can also downsize in your chambering size to have more ground clearance and still get a super low gear 
at the top end. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds there. It's a really good idea. But in order to do that without redesigning the hub or the free hub body like we've seen both Shimano do with Microshift and SRAM do with the XD driver. The clever thing about the E13 is it fits on an XD driver, but the cassette is a two-piece design. The bigger sprockets at the back are made from aluminium. Now they slide on to the XD bit, and then you know at the top of an XD driver body you have the threads. It has a lock ring that locates onto there, and then the steel part of the cassette, which are the cogs that you use more often and therefore wear out more, instead of being alloy, obviously they're made of steel, they screw onto the upper part of the cassette. It's an ingenious design. And one of the coolest things about this, is A, that it enables them to use that even smaller step down 90 for the bottom because you don't need a regular cassette tool to go in the end there anymore with that system. But also it means you can replace either part of the cassette, you know, whichever one you wear out or damage or whatever happens to it, you can replace them individually, which is cool. So there's a few shots of this one on screen. It comes in five different colors, one of which has a, uh, let me get this right, PVD coating. So it's a coating basically to make it insanely tough and more durable. That is the blue effect on there. Uh, there's loads of other ones, so they call that intergalactic blue, by the way. It does look pretty mad. I love the color, um, the color name for that. So a little bit about this cassette. So it's got 556% gear ratio. So if you think about, this is in the 12 speed, it comes in 11 speed as well. Probably should have said that one. Uh, when you look at the Shimano and SRAM 12 speed cassettes, the latest versions have 51 teeth and 52 teeth. So it's 510 and 520% gear ratio. So it's got even more at 556 because of that tiny little nine tooth. Now it's great if you struggle on your climbs because it does mean you can downsize, um, you can downsize your chambering size to get a smaller and a lower climbing gear without sacrificing your higher gear. So that's pretty cool. Now it's also insanely light. So the Shimano XT cassette, just as a benchmark model, uh, that weighs four, 470 grams. Okay, so it's not the lightest out there. SRAM's X01 cassette, it kind of sits roughly about the same level, 354 grams. The E13 cassette weighs 345 grams. So that's up there with the higher spec cassettes from both SRAM and Shimano there. So that's really cool. I think it looks really cool. This is some more shots of it on screen. I just think it's really nice. It's a really good bit of engineering. It's really well manufactured. They've thought about things that are applicable to you or I that ride lots and might not always use those lower gears. So the lower gears, obviously, they're making out of alloy to keep the weight down. They make the gears you use more out of steel. Brilliant bit of design. I'd love to know what you think of those E13 cassettes, but uh, super cool. Okay, so next in news is a hardtail from the British brand Kotick. Now this is called the Beefy, and this is it on screen. It's a 27 and a half inch wheel hardtail, and actually it's throwing back to their first bike. I think it was around 2004, 2005, which would have been 26 inch wheel. Um, I actually rode one, and it was bloody fantastic. It was such a good frame back then, full of life, um, which is something really important to pick up on, on steel hardtails. Anyone could just get some steel tubing and weld up a hardtail frame, obviously any frame manufacturer could do that. But it doesn't always guarantee you're gonna get that good ride of steel. Now you might have heard about this before, so you get a nice springy, resilient nature to, to steel. But if you use steel tube and it's too thick or too heavy or it's not got butting in the right places, you can end up with a ride that feels a bit dead. So they get around this by having pretty tough tubing everywhere, but the down tube is made from Reynolds 853. So not only does that keep the weight down a little bit, but it also gives it that springy, lovely steel nature back, which I think is really cool. So it's 550 quid in the UK, so it's about the same in US dollars, uh, for the frame only. So you could arguably transplant your stuff off your full suspension bike onto that as a winter bike, um, saving you a bit of cash and wear on your winter bike, giving you the opportunity then to properly service uh, put an invisi frame kit or whatever on your on your full suspension bike over the winter and it'll be fresh for the season after all that mud. Uh, winter bikes are kind of getting more and more popular as people understand the fact that maintaining a full suspension bike if you ride in northern hemisphere conditions through winter can be pretty malicious to your bike. Uh, so this one's designed around a 140mm fork, uh, you can fit a 120 on it or a 160 depending on your preferences for ride. Uh, sizing is quite interesting, so from 438 up to 513 millimeter reach. So that's a really big sized bike on there. 428 mil chain stays on the back. Man, that thing is gonna love back wheel. You're pretty much just gonna lean back and you're gonna be down the road. Awesome. Uh, the bottom bracket now is 10 mil lower. It's a really low bottom bracket on there. And it comes in gloss orange or army green. Wicked, great looking bike. Nice one to the guys. Cotting in Cy, his name is in fact Cy Turner. Okay, so now something very special, very different. So the Kinderne gearbox. Uh, so it's actually a hub with a gearbox on the inside. So you might have seen the roll-off one previously. So this is the roll-off one on screen, which also had 14 gears. Now the roll-off one weighs 1,680 grams. 
the Kindle name one weighs 1,400 grams. So to put that into perspective against a normal hub, you're talking around between 250 and 350 grams for a typical rear mountain bike hub. So it's quite a lot heavier, but you're removing all your gears, all your transmission stuff, and you're getting 14 gears, which is kind of equivalent to having a three by uh, system on your bike. But obviously that's not for everyone, but the person that wants maximum amount of gears, they want to bin off the derailleur and all that stuff, and have something that is just almost zero maintenance, then this could be for you. And actually, it would be a perfect candidate on a hardtail frame if you want to build up a just no weather's gonna phase the bike. This could be great. Now, the hub on the inside, the cool thing about this, the especially cool thing, except the fact it has gears in there, obviously, is the fact the hub can slide out of the outer hub. So there's kind of like an outer hub which has the flanges and a shell on it. That remains as part of the wheel, and you can remove the inner part that has the gearbox in it you can take that straight out of the wheel for easy servicing and obviously easy cleaning and maintaining of the rest of the wheel. I think this is a really cool system. And it's a hydraulic gear actuation on there as well, uh, which is very cool, given the fact that Roll-Off and some of the other brands that are doing hub gears, basically the, the shifters on them are pretty awful. Sometimes they're gear sh like grip shifters, sometimes they're huge, they have two cables going in. This one is really neat. Look how neat and tidy the lever looks on this. Now this may not be the future for everyone because of course putting loads of weight in the center of the rear hub increases your sprung mass. You want to be reducing your, uh, sorry, your unsprung mass, of course, to make your suspension work better. However, it's an amazing way around lots of other problems you get on mountain bikes. I think it looks incredible. I would love to try one of these. Uh, now to say it's instant shifting, you can shift when coasting, pedaling, underload, doesn't matter. That's a huge appeal and it's gonna outlast your bike. Uh, that's a great statement to have with the hub. If you're spending money on something like that, you can move your entire transmission between bikes. Could be the last transmission you ever buy. Um, I think that is a wicked system. Uh, we'll leave you a few more shots of it on screen. I'd love to know what you think of in internal hub gears and gearboxes in general, actually. And I've been wanting to make a gearbox video for a while, but I haven't found the way of doing it. So we will do it at some point. We've just gotta make everything line, you know, so. A little tricky trying to get all these videos made when we have so many videos we've got to make constantly. Some of them take a long time, some of them you've got to get them out the door. Okay, so next up, probably the coolest hotel I have seen, period. This is it. This is a Con Kona Honzo. This is the ESD model, so the extreme geometry one. So it's basically a downhill style hardtail, mega slack front end. But this particular build belongs to a guy called John, who is a bike shop owner in, in fact, he runs a bike shop, I like, in, uh, in downtown Denver. Now he's got a bit of a scar theme going on here. So you've got the red Lyric Ultimate on the front, the polished red frame, which just looks amazing anyway. Now it's got front mudguard from Occam Designs uh, with the scar sort of checker checkerboard print on there, which just looks super cool. And then also, if you look closely, in fact, you might see it in one of these detail shots, it's got an inner tube style enduro strap on it, but it's got BOA on it. And that one's also made by Occam Designs, uh, who I didn't know about, but I'm glad I know about because I'm gonna look them up now. A BOA design on one of those instead of Velcro. Yeah, I'm really feeling that. That looks like a really cool piece of kit. And just, I mean, look at the thing, it looks amazing. Town wall tires, I've always had a bit of a weakness for those. That looks great. It's got 200 mil rotors, front and rear. Um, it's also got a reggae themed colored stem spaces on there and also one of those Chinelli top caps. I think they're the mash top cap, so it comes from a sort of fixie seam. And also to match in with that, the sort of uh, the reggae themed 50 to one edition version of that fabric saddle. Man, what a bike. I think that just looks so cool. Has anyone out there done a dream build of their own like this? They've really gone to town on anything. If you have, I would love to see it. And if you've made a real special effort with the bike, if it's that good, maybe we'll come and see you and make a video of it. Um, I would like to start doing some stuff with more special bikes on the channel. Um, obviously we're still under restrictions at the moment, but when things ease, uh, we'd love to come and do some bikes like this. We do pro bike checks. Why not do pimp bike checks? except not with a pimp, that would just be weird. I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, okay, so uh, last in news, just a couple of things on Instagram that have been floating around. Um, stitched myself up there, didn't I, with that pimp thing? Ignore me, shoot me, whatever, let me know. Um, so first up on the Instagram thing, Bruni's bike. Now, obviously it's been World Champs week, he had this insane looking bike, as you can see on screen. In fact, if you don't follow him on Instagram, his handle is at the bottom of the screen there, uh, you should. He posts really cool stuff and he's an unbelievable rider and a super nice guy as well. But look at this little carbon fiber bit of housing on the bike. What do you reckon's in there? Well, as you can see, it's got Olin shock. And he's got an Olin's fork on there. It also looks like there might be something on the handlebar, some sort of remote um, that could be going into there. So maybe it's a remote piggyback. We'll have to wait and see. There's a few shots on his Instagram. You can actually see that carbon bit of housing there. 
don't think it's to protect anything. I think it's there to hide something. So we should be watching that one with uh, bated breath to see what happens next. And the last one um, is that formula, the Mod Shock. Uh, here it is on screen. This is with the ultraviolet spring on it, which I just think that color just is incredible. It's so unique. It's really giving formula a bit of an identity. Again, they did the silver fork of course in that color and they're approaching things very differently so there's some seriously cool features on this so in the piggyback on it instead of having an internal floating piston like an ifp in there it's basically got a bladder design so the bladder design is low pressure as well which also means it can be less stiction less friction in there uh, you can inflate it with a shock pump you don't need nitrogen in there uh, everything about it's better it's got a bigger bore piston on the inside for better oil flow better heat management lower friction and sticks just everything about it just sounds amazing and it's also got what you can see here called the CTS compression tuning system so each shop comes with three of these a light a medium and a firm and it's super easy to change yourself so you can change the compression tune not the adjustment but the tune of it so I just think this shock has just got legs, really does look like an amazing piece of kit. I must try one soon. I think that looks like a really good piece of kit. But uh, there you go. If you guys have seen anything awesome on Instagram, let us know in those comments underneath. Okay, so on last week's show, we had a bit of a topic and it was all about the name of the coolest bike out there. So I picked the Specialized Stump Jumper um, as just the coolest name because I just think it's such a descriptive name of what, what you do on a bike, jumping over stumps and stuff. Uh, and everyone let me know in the comments what they thought and put some pretty funny comments in there to be fair. Uh, the first comment I want to read out is from Big Bird. It says, with the Humu, one must pronounce both of the A's at the end. So that was a Kona, um, if I get this right, Humu Humu Nuka Nuka Pua Ah. Humu Humu Nuka Nuka Pua Ah. I think I got it right, but uh, yeah, cool. Thanks for setting me straight on that because I wouldn't want to offend anyone for saying that wrong. A uh, bit of a complex name. Next one is from BC12794, whatever. Um, Muddy Fox Pathfinder. Classic name, the first UK mass market mountain bike, and it got the best name first. Do you know what? It's a really cool name. I think Stump Jump is better, personally, but uh, the Pathfinder's great. I had a friend who had a Pathfinder. I used to have a Korea Mega. I didn't have one of the super early ones where Muddy Fox were like, like really legit, like really cool, but uh, great brand, so good. Uh, next one's from uh, Fernando Pimentel. I had an early 90s iron horse called Ditch Pig. <laughs> Man, I don't remember that one, but um, I'm not sure I'd want that. That's like a pair of cheap tires you get for your car and a pair of ditch finders. You don't want a ditch pig, do you? Just end up in a ditch, surely. Uh, next one's from Jeff T. Uh, Carpial Apocalypse, all the Armageddon. Yeah, fair play. That's ridiculous bikes, ridiculous names. Now, I can't remember which one of, the, one of them, probably the Armageddon, had two shocks on it. That was the bike that was built for Josh Bender to do his massive 60 foot drops. I'll tell you what, I'd like to do something with Josh Bender at some point. I don't even know if he's still around anymore, but. That guy, he got a bit of flack for all his crazy riding back in the day, but if he didn't do that, I'm pretty sure like Rampage and other stuff wouldn't have started. I'm fairly sure Rampage was his idea, because he used to be a free skier, he used to do similar events where he'd session a cliff and trying to find the right line. Um, absolute pioneer of, of that side of free ride mountain biking and an absolute nutcase in the best possible way. Flipping out, he must have some serious set of cojones on him. Uh, next up is from uh, Ben, ben Cardu. The best name had to be the Ragley Mbop. Hmm, I'm going to have to disagree with that. I'm not sure about the Mbop. Um, Ragley bikes though, super cool bikes. I love their bikes. And actually the designer behind them also used to design for Planet X. Now they had a bike called the Kaffenbach. I think it was spelled K-A-F-F-E-N-B-A-C-K. -E um, sounded like it could be German name or something bizarre, but it was meant to ride to the Kaff and back, Kaffenbach. Pretty funny, I thought. Uh, but they also had a bike with a bit of an offensive name. I don't know if this was Planet X or it was uh, Ragley. They had the retard. But it was just a play on words because they were all northern and it was reet hard, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. And uh, some other names that you all seem to like. Uh, Gorilla Gravity Nirvana. Uh, tongue in cheek. I think that's ridiculous, but very cool guys and a cool bike. Uh, Commercial The Clash. Yeah, a few of you said about the Commercial names with the Ramones, kids bikes and stuff. Surly Karate Monkey, yeah, bonkers name. And uh, the Surly Crew, hilarious as well. Great bunch of bike industry people. Cro-Mag Root Down, I hadn't heard of that one, but I uh, love BC Boys, Root Down, great tune. And Root Down, brilliant descriptive name. Mountain Goat Whiskey Town Racer, yeah, that's actually probably one of the coolest names of all time. I uh, can't believe I didn't mention that one. Mountain Goat Whiskey Town Racer, mega. I wonder how it got its name, does anyone actually know? I don't know that. No, Mountain Goat was a brand, Whiskey Town Racer was, was the bike. I'd love to know. Uh, let us know in those comments if you do. 
And uh, final one actually came up a few times, British designer called Shaz Roberts. He had a bike called the Dog's Bollocks. Uh, that was a bit of an expression in London and the UK. Uh, you say the Dog's Bollocks basically meant uh, your bike was really good. And in retaliation to that, another British designer called Dave Yates made one called the Donkey's Knob. Um, well, each to their own. But I enjoyed reading those comments and thank you everyone for getting involved. I uh, hope you get involved with uh, the start of this week's show as well. Okay, so let's have a bit of rewind action. Now I pre-filmed this. Um, this is involving a 1988 specialized stump jumper. I actually filmed this when I did the video all about that POC helmet that went out the weekend. If you haven't seen that video, check out the link underneath. Uh, it's worth a watch because that helmet genuinely has some really interesting tech in it. But uh, over to me with that bike. Now whilst on the topic of bikes with really cool names, I thought I'd do a bit of a rewind special on this 1988 Specialized Stump Jumper Comp. Now this one belongs to Steve Jones from EMBN. He's had this since the 80s. I think he washed it once and uh, he's never maintained it uh, by the looks of it. There's loads of bulges in that front tire, which is an original Specialized Ground Control, which I can't believe it's still the original tire. On the back, it's got a fake uh, Panaracer uh, smoke on the back. It's actually made by Kenda, this one, but it's a, a knockoff version. And actually, it's really quite a cool bike. So look at the geometry on it. At a glance, it might look really, really dated, but relatively long chain stays, pretty slack head angle on the front there. The whole bike has a pretty good position, although it is pretty small, to be clear about this. Now it's got Shimano Deal DX rear derailleur on there. It's got DX transmission. It's got an XT front derailleur, Biopace chain rings. So they were the original elliptical style chain rings that actually Shimano stopped making after a while after people complaining of people's, I don't know, knees hurting and stuff like that. Deal DX front hub on there, a Deal rear hub with a Mavic CD M7 rear rim. And I think it's got an array on the front that's so worn through, it's terrifying to even ride this bike. Bearing in mind that on old bikes like this, you are braking on a structural part of the wheel. It wasn't like a disc rotor that you just replaced that component. You're braking on the bit that actually holds the wheel together. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? and still road cyclists still query about this. That makes sense to me. But um, the coolest thing about this bike, other than the fact it's totally original and still rideable. Oh, I should mention the, uh, the U-brake down the bottom here. So these were hilarious when they came out. They actually had quite good power, but located down there, unless you're in California in the dust, completely useless, clogged up with mud. Major bike just turned into a big tennis ball of mud down here. Uh, it's got a Shimano shark tooth on it. So a lot of you might be familiar with the shark fin, which is mounted on the chain stay in order to stop the chain going down that gap and giving you chain suck. You have the same problem with these U-brakes where the chain will try and get jammed in between the outer chain ring and the actual brake. And you can see there's some scarring on this one here. The shark tooth would actually attempt to stop it before that happened. But as I was about to say, probably the coolest and the funniest thing about this bike is the scale of it. So this is a 19 inch and a 26 inch wheels. Now when I stand up, it will look quite funny, but not as funny as it will look when you see it next to my bike that's next to it. Check this out. Yeah, so in 1988, when this was out, I'd have been nine years old. It probably would have fitted me then. But look at this. How crazy is that? It's how far we've come in all these years. Absolutely bonkers. But we wouldn't have anything like this if it wasn't for bikes like this back in the day. I know which one I've picked now. Okay, now it's time for top mods. This is all about the modifications you make to your bikes. Everything that makes your bike a little bit different to your mates or the one that you can buy in the shops, anything counts, anything goes. There's a link at the bottom of the screen right there. Now, actually on last week's show, a few of you entered some um, homemade tools into top mods. Please continue doing that. Anything that you do, any modifications you do in your workshop, your bike cave, anything, send them in. We love them. Honestly, we absolutely love them. And they give us great ideas as well. And hopefully it gives you lots of great ideas. Uh, so this one's from Adam in West Sussex. So his bike is an Orange 5 factory. Finding my new light battery was fairly heavy and it used to swing around on hard trails. So that's how you hope battery. Um, you get some lights, of course, like um, these exposure ones I have, like the battery on the inside, but most lights always used to have a big sort of battery unit that you'd have to strap onto the bike somewhere, like the Hope ones. In fact, I have got an old one somewhere. Amazing lights, they're really, really good, but yeah, that battery can be a bit of an issue. So he's 3D printed a bracket. It looks like it's part of the light. I think this is genius. Looks so neat and tidy and sits into that shock mount there just to stop it moving. What a wicked idea, Adam. So nicely done. 
and Hope and Orange, two British brands on a bike. Match made in heaven right there. Yeah, it looks very cool. Nice work. Okay, next one is from Fergus in Dunoon in Scotland. Hi Dolly, I saw the latest episode about making your own tools and I've just got a new Cane Creek DB inline coil. Oh, nice bit of kit that. Um, what's that on a specialized turbo levo by the looks of it? Man, you've, uh, you've been screwing away some money. Fair play. Uh, yes, of course the bike is allowed. Uh, we're, we're not sort of, uh, we're inclusive is what I was trying to say. It doesn't matter what you have on here. So something with a shock is the adjuster would actually stick out the left side of the top tube. A few bruises later and a fruitless Google search for help, um, I ended up making up my own tool to rotate the adjuster casting out the way. Okay, interesting. The tool was originally a race vest bottom bracket tool, which I filed all but three of the points off. The tool worked perfectly, and now I've mounted the shot where my knee doesn't get bashed. That's interesting. Well, so you can't just um, turn it normally. You have to turn the casting separately to the head. Cool. Well, it's definitely worked. That's a wicked little tool. Of course, that's going to live in your toolbox now because you might need to turn it back if you move it to another bike. Nice slippers, by the way. Are they the North Face ones? I've got some of those. Great in the winter. Uh, next up is from Russ in Ontario, Canada. He's got 2021 Marin Hawk Hill 3, or a Marin Hawk Hill 3. This is uh, my 3D printed dummy hub stroke cassette that I made for use when the rear wheel's off. It makes cleaning the rear derailleur much easier. Genius. You can buy these, yeah, but I guess if you've got a 3D printer, why, why would you not make one? Because nearly free, yeah. You <laughs> had uh, 40 cents to make, yeah. Basically free. Wicked idea. Uh, also pretends to disc rotor from getting contaminated when I'm doing drivetrain cleaning. Yes, what a great idea. Uh, that is awesome. I'm gonna poach that one, if you don't mind. Um, that is wicked. Nice one, Russ. Yeah, and there's a better angle there, you can see it. Genuinely a simple, great idea. Wicked stuff, yeah, and there it is in all its glory. Best things are always the most simple things, aren't they? Um, if you've got any more top mods or any homemade tools, we'd love to see them. Get involved and we'll catch up with Bike Cave on next week's show. Ah, well, there we go. That's the end of this week's GMBN Tech Show. Uh, what was your favourite bit of tech on the show? And more importantly, get involved with that downhill bike conversation from the beginning. You know, are downhill bikes cooler than enduro bikes? Are they pointless? What's better? Let us know in those comments and um, I'll, I'll see you in the comments very shortly. Thanks for watching. See you later.